Good afternoon. Hello, Nola Time, fellow ruminators. Thank you so much for joining. And we are uh, videotaping, actually recording this video on, this is uh, today is what, November 6th, 2024, after November 5th, right? The day of the election of the President of the United States. And we are learning now that Donald Trump has won the election of the United States. He is now, well, will be the 47th president on January 20th, when he is going to be invested officially, um, given that everything goes well. Now, we are living in a very, very interesting world. And the I think that Donald Trump won an election that was due to him, right? It's not, he did not win by, you know, by default. I think that he won a hard-earned victory. I think he put up a great fight. Because remember now that, you know, right throughout the time when he came back that he was going to run for the presidency, all of the allegations of he's a criminal victim, he's a felon, came about the court cases. He had to attend a lot of court cases that would have weighed him down mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, in, in all facets of his life, right? Yet he kept on the fight. One of the things you have to give Donald Trump the credit for is that he is a person who does not shy away from a challenge. And he challenged that juggernaut, the system, the political system that the Democratic Party um, actually set up against him and his followers. Because at the end of the day, Donald Trump's win is not only for Donald Trump, it is for his followers. And that is what we have to understand. A lot of times when we pay attention to political leaders, we pay attention only to the leader, him or herself. Right. But in this case, and in any case, Donald Trump has millions of followers, which the United States had to admit they wanted to deny it, particularly among the Democratic Party or in the Democratic Party. But they eventually have to come to recognize that many U.S. citizens are not happy with the state of what is happening in that country. In fact, there was a poll done and CNN was reporting it last night. And I was wondering, was it CNN or MSNBC? And I was wondering, why were they doing that now? You know, where, shouldn't that have been done where they were saying, I think 43% of Americans are dissatisfied um, with where the country is heading. And I think 23% of Americans are angry, are angry at the trajectory on which the United States is actually um, heading to, you know? So when you think about that, about 72 or so percent of the people are not satisfied with what is happening in the U.S. But you would have thought during the campaign that the Democratic Party was suggesting that they're not going back. They're not going back. And this was Kamala's, you know, primary, what you call it now. It, it was her platform. What's the word? I'm forgetting the word right now. This was what she waged her. This was the theme of her platform. Right, the slogan, that's the word I was looking for. This was a slogan that she used, that she's not going back. And I was always asking, going back to what? But I think in that she was implying that America was on this neoliberal pathway and they were not going to go back to the era where America worked for Americans and not for the elites, not for the oligarchy. Well, it has always worked for the oligarchy, but the oligarchy, at least to some extent, shares some of its wealth. What we're seeing now is that the oligarchy is seeking to take more portions of the wealth from the middle class and also the working class in America. And uh, Americans are feeling it and they're experiencing it daily. Pamela Harris, who is a millionaire, seems not to have been able to grasp that. She was more willing to say that she grew up in a middle class family. And I don't know if she has a day of suffering because her father was a college professor. Her mom, too, was a college professor. And they were both renowned college professors. I'm not saying now that they were billionaires and millionaires, but they lived a, a decent life. And she was not brought up to suffer, as some Americans are aware of and have experienced. So she was behaving as if the people's plight, their experience, their economic situation was not authentic, was not valid. And I think that she would lose on that primary ground. The economy was one in which she had really fallen flat and she was not able to articulate 
a credible, viable plan in which he would have improved the economy of the United States. Now, notice I use the word neoliberal because that is what this neoliberal path of the United States is really engaged in right now and is clearly treading on the fact that it wants public-private partnership. And it is there to, the, the, the elites along with the government are working and what they do, they extract the wealth from the people and then they tell you that it's just life and you just have to deal with it, right? But they, so they send their politicians into office who do the bidding of the elites and they enter into these free trade agreements, right? Such as NAFTA, CAFTA, all of these free trade agreements are not free in any sense of the word. And what it does economically, it rates the people of their wealth, right? of their investments, of their assets. And people have been expressing this, but the successive governments in the United States have been ignoring it to their detriment. Now we have that, you know, the whole matter of the Democratic Party, which was the party which once was, it's no longer, the party of unions, the party of labor, the party of the working class, right? That is what the Democratic Party was, well, it, it says it was under FDR. Now remember now that nothing is set in stone. The Democratic Party was also the party of slavery, right? And it was the party of conservatism in which they believed in small government. So during slavery, the Democratic Party likewise believed in small government, while the Republicans were the ones who were more pro-government because of the fact that the federal government was called upon to end slavery throughout the states. Remember now that the government had to intervene um, during slavery. And the whole question of freedom, as they were talking about you know, reproductive rights, and that's why we have to be careful when we hear about rights, when the government begin, begin to say that they're going to give us rights. The government is, does not have the capacity to give us any rights. And if they give you any rights, they can take it back tomorrow or they can use it to their advantage and not to the advantage of the people. So during slavery, the Democratic Party, they were arguing for states' rights because they're saying if the states have rights. It means, therefore, that they could peddle slavery in any part of the United States. Because remember now that the question of slavery was not, is slavery wrong initially, until you had people like the Frederick Douglass and, all, and other progressive white Americans who, you know, were against slavery, until they argued that the system was moral, morally wrong, it was the fact that the Democratic Party, which was the religious party of the time, they were arguing that, yes, they had the rights, that states have rights, they should have the autonomy. So if they want to have slavery in California, if they want to have slavery in any state of the United States, it, you know, because that's what the purpose was, that the United States was being expanded just around about 1840s and the 1840s, right up to the Civil War, America was gaining a lot of territory, particularly after the, the Mex Mexican-American War. So when they did that now, they, you know, they were say, arguing not that Abraham Lincoln was against slavery in the South. He was not against slavery in the South initially until, you know, of course, he was convinced that that was also immoral. I don't think Abraham Lincoln liked it, but for the purpose of saving the Union, let's, let's be clear on that now. He did not like slavery, but he did not want to interrupt. He did not want to disrupt. He did not want to you know, create any friction, controversy uh, between or uh, among the states to create this civil war. His purpose was to save the Union and avoid any civil war because civil war, the civil war could have ended the United States as we know it. It's the power, it's a miracle of God that saved that country. And I go back to the verse in um, Daniel 2 verse 44, because sometimes I'm guilty too. It says here in Daniel 2, verse 21 to 22, it says, and he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and he setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that you understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth that he knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. 
So God knows what is in darkness. We are the ones who do not know what is in the darkness. And sometimes he has to prevent certain things from occurring because we would have long consumed ourselves. Had God not specially interposed in the Civil War, the United States would not have survived. It was a terrible war, which costed the United States a lot of its citizens. Over 647,000 people died in that one war. Right, So it's, this was a very, very important war. Now, fast forward to 2024, particularly in the 21st century, we have seen where America has taken on a new image of being the country that is constantly waging unending wars. And these wars are having very deleterious effects having deleterious effects on the on the citizens. Now, remember now that wars are destructive in nature. They not only destroy, destroy physical property and destroy people's livelihoods and their lives and everything, but they also destroy the human soul, right? Even your soul is destroyed by this constant waging of wars, right? You become calloused. Right? You become like an animal, a savage animal, a brute animal. And we have people in the United States that we call the neocons who have been pushing, who have been known to have been pushing wars. I have said on this channel before that you have what you call the project for the new American century, which people like the Bill Crystals and other is Crystal, right? Bill Crystal and among other famous um, American political leaders have crafted. And they have crafted a world even before the Cold War was finished. And that, you know, sort of think tank or theoretical framework, ideological framework was, you know, was sort of, you know, uh, developed to strengthen, to solidify America's predominance or its dominance in the world. So even before we knew that China was going to come up as a, you know, powerful nation, the United States had it that they had already plotted a war waged with China against China, right? Had already plotted a war long before China came up as a powerful and as a competitor to its economic and military dominance. Iran, the same thing. Russia, the same thing. Afghanistan, long before America went into Afghanistan, right? The war was already being or the plan had already been designed that they would also have gone into Afghanistan, Iraq, from you know the 1990s when Bill Clinton also went there. Well, imposed economic sanctions on Iraq that caused half a million children to have died. Half a million children died because of U.S. economic sanctions on Iraq. And then they went back there in 2001 after 9-11 event, or 2003 rather, beg your pardon, and killed another, um, killed millions of people, right? And these things are going to have consequences, not only economic consequences, consequences but military consequences on the United States citizens. Because when you, when the soul of a nation is lost, it means therefore that it will not, the government no longer has compassion for its own citizens. Because sometimes Americans like to think themselves as special people. But when the government becomes that callous, right, and become um, very war, you know, has this warmongering disposition, they are going to be called towards you, the citizen. And that is why we're seeing that economically, the United States is not doing well because it has invested too much money. It has invested its life and its savings and its all its energies into waging wars and waging wars with the intention of controlling the entire world. Now you might ask the question, why are they waging wars? They can stop it tomorrow. Yeah, they can stop it tomorrow, but it means therefore the United States will not be seen as the major superpower of the world and any other country could contest it. And the US is suggesting that we can't allow any other country, we can't even left it up to their imagination to even want to dare to challenge our global supremacy in the world. So the United States says that in order to capture, uh, in order to control the world, we have to control the human resource, the economic resources of these countries.
right? Whether the oil or the gas, all of these gold, all of the, 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 the minerals of the world, they must be in control. If not, then other countries are going to say, well, we have this. And if you, you know, then they will be able to, you know, negotiate better on better terms with the U.S. The U.S. does not want any form of negotiation. They don't, they no longer believe in diplomacy. The United States, particularly the Democratic Party, believes in militarism. And militarism does not mean that you just a military, you have a military and they wage wars. Militarism is the fact that you believe in war as the only weapon, as the only means of solving problems in the world. So if the if if, if the United States, for example, wants you know the oil in Venezuela, they're not going to go there and negotiate on Venezuelan terms in terms of how they could get some of the oil. They just want to capture the oil fields and say it belongs to us. Now, people are not just going to allow that to happen, people to come to their homes and just say your bed and your pots and your stoves and, you know, and, and your refrigerators are mine. People are not going to allow that. They are going to what? They are going to put up a fight. Right? That's the best analogy. If somebody comes, invades your home because they think that they are stronger than you are, and that's what men tend to do, the survival of the fittest, then you are going to put up a fight. And that's what honorable people do. I'm not suggesting that you know you should fight, but I'm saying that that is a natural instinct of any human being to defend what is theirs and to defend their territories. So you, you find now that the United States, you know, engages in deposing governments, in um changing the outcomes of elections. So when it's talking about, you know, Russia and all of that stuff, the United States has always engaged, particularly since, you know, the Cold War, the, the post-Cold War, World War One, right? The World War Two, I beg your pardon, right? Particularly after World War Two, they have been engaged in deposing and in altering the elections of, of, um, of different presidents and prime ministers around us. Prime ministers around the world. So you have in um in, in North Korea, in South Korea, in Guatemala, in Nicaragua, in Honduras, right? They, they have been engaged all around the world, in Jamaica, in Chile, in the Dominican Republic, right? These have been victims of US intervention, Haiti, and how they weaponize uh imperialism against these countries and their governments. Now, the Democratic Party, as we suggested, is no longer the party of unions because it is a party of war. Bill Clinton solidified, made the final agreement with the corporate interests in America, with Wall Street interests and with the oligarchy to have the Democratic Party be controlled by them. Since that time, we had Barack Obama, who came to power in 2008, who even further solidified the identity of the Democrats as being pro-corporate America and not pro-labor, pro-the people, pro-unions. And this is the quandary that we're now facing. So we, so from 2000, from 19, 1990s, people were already upset with Bill Clinton. And for that reason, the Clintons have never been respected because they have done quite a lot of things Apart from his sexual um, escapades, Bill Clinton is known to have been a snake and someone who, you know, smiles with you while behind the scenes he's crafting policies that will go against you. And many Americans understood that, particularly those who lived in the area of America, the Rust Belt, where they had factories. And these factories were decimated because of the free trade agreements. And that is why when Hillary Clinton came on the scene in 2016, she was not even able to apologize to these people that, you know, I was a part of a regime, even though at the time she was just a first lady. So we can't say that she was. But, you know, books have been written that she was very involved in her husband's um, in her husband's administration. Right. She was actively involved. And she was one, we know that she would help to have crafted the then aborted health care plan that Obama passed when he came to office, right? So we had the Clinton era in which people's jobs went because of the free trade agreement, NAFTA particularly, and other free trade, free trade agreements um, that 
the United States entered into. Remember now, free trade is not free trade. Just means, therefore, that the these corporations are de-industrializing. The, it, 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 the, the de-industrialization of the American economy started under Clinton, right? And it continued under um, George Bush because George Bush was the one who came up with CAFTA. So from the NAFTA, we had the CAFTA. And then it continued. Now, fast forward to Barack Obama's presidency, he continued with the waging of the wars. He's known as the drone president, even though he spoke about hope and change and that he would have ended the wars. But instead of ending the wars, he continued a lot of the wars. He escalated the wars around the world because Obama, you know, had that sort of inclination. He's like a Bill Clinton, where he gives you this illusion that he is for peace. But when he went to office, he crafted policies and he did things that suggested that he is also a war monger, uh, a war hawk. Now, when Hillary Clinton came to power, well, when she was vying for the presidency in 2016, she never won. Um, she did not even apologize, as I mentioned. She called these people who had lost their jobs and they were trying to, because these people were pro-Democrats because, you know, they grew up, you know, their parents, that the Democratic Party was pro-labor and give the Democratic their party they were really living up to some extent to their name, right? In terms of being pro-labor, of being pro-union and people at the lower stratum of the American society, the working class, they were able to, you know, um, have their factory jobs and send their children to school to buy their car homes and, you know, they have a decent way of life, right? So after that free trade agreement, all of these things went and many of these cities, were completely decimated and people are suffering. People are left suffering, not only blacks, and they tend to always put all oh, the black Americans need to do this and the Latinos, but a lot of white people are struggling. Let me repeat that. So when you talk about Trump is this sort of anti-black and he's anti-Latino and all of these, you know, Nazi people are with him and these, you know, uber racist people now i'm not suggesting that there might not be some nazis just like on in the democratic party and on in, in in the republican party but i'm suggesting to you that it's not only racist and white supremacists are in trump's campaign in his not his campaign but in his under his banner right there are lots of black people who understand that i think he could have gathered for the, his victory just now over about 25% of the black vote, right? That Trump garnered more, much more than he had won in 2016 because people are looking keenly. They're not depending on the New York Times and the Washington Post to form their world perspective. They understand based on their experience what they're seeing. They see the patterns and they realize that the Democratic Party is no longer sympathetic to the working class, to labor, and to union. And we see now that um, the Donald Trump, because I am now going to call America the Trumpian country, because it has become a Trumpian country. And I did say, I did not know he would... Okay, I know he would have won the popular vote, but I thought that the Democrats would do something to ensure that he does not go back... <clears throat> by having Kamala win the Electoral College votes. But I knew, based on what I saw on the ground and well, based on what I was reading, that the United States citizens were not pro Kamala because Kamala was waging a sort of campaign that was more geared towards wars and also abortion. Now, how can you have a campaign and all that you are confident in talking about are two things. Wars, unending wars, and abortion, the murder of innocent young babies. Now, what sort of civil nation is that? And I don't think people have yet grasped the, I don't think they yet they have had an understanding of how crude that is. I think we have become so much hypnotized by what we were seeing because notice that Kamala, she would have garnered over, well, I think it's just under a billion dollars for her campaign. In a short space of time, she was able to compile to 
amassed to herself under a billion dollars, just under a billion. I think it was $993 million that she actually, you know, was able to, to get for her campaign. Trump spent under that, I think way under that, I think his was like 300 million, I understand. Yet he won because the people, it's not about money, it's about the people's concern. And I must give America its credit today. I'm, hope I'm not rambling, and perhaps I am, but try to understand me, try to keep up with what I'm saying. I must commend America for upholding democracy, as it says, it, it, it as it was actually touting itself to be. During the pandemic, I had a lot of questions about that, and even post-pandemic, and how the things, even the elections, all the elections were carried out in 2020. I think there were lots of shenanigans, if the truth be told. However, this election seemed to have been seamlessly done. And I think that, thank God, it, it's, it's over and done, right? And Donald Trump is the winner. Now, I opened the paper this morning um, to go to the political, and they say that Trump is back, right? Trump is back. That is what the political is saying. Um, he prevailed through a 34-count felony conviction, two assassination attempts, and bipartisan backlash to return to power. And they have, they're all saying Trump promised to get revenge. Here are his targets. And they're all predicting already that he's going to be this very revengeful president. The policies that will define Trump's second term. And of course, they're going to have a lot of, you know, scare and doom. Trump has humiliated his foes, right? This is what the political is saying. Now, we have here New York Times is saying Trump storms back, stunning return to power after dark and defiant campaign. And I want to know what was dark about his campaign. I think that the Democratic campaign was darker. When I saw all those celebrities and what they were doing at the DNC, it was horrific. It was horrendous to watch what they were doing. I thought it was it bordered on being <laughs> diabolic and this whole matter of abortion and all that they were clamoring for. I thought the Democratic Party, they ran a darker, a spiritually darker campaign than Trump did, if you should ask me, if I should, if I should speak the truth. And Trump returns to power, ushering a new era of uncertainty. But all presidencies are going to be uncertain whether it's the Democratic. So the, that's what the New York Times is saying. Donald J. Trump wrote a promise to smash the American status quo to win the presidency for a second time on Wednesday. So they're actually repeating some of the truth. They're telling us some of the truth that he actually is smashing the American status quo, surviving a criminal conviction, indictments, and assassin's bullet accusations of authoritarianism, and an unprecedented switch of his opponent to complete a remarkable return to power. Mr. Trump's victory caps the astonishing political comeback of a man who was charged with plotting to overturn the last election, but who tapped into frustrations and fears about the economy and illegal immigration to defeat Vice President Kamala Harris. His defiant plans to upend the country's political system held appeal to tens of millions of voters who feared that the American dream was drifting further from reach and who turned to Mr. Trump as a battering ram against the ruling establishment and the expert class of elites. Right? So it is just now that American intellectual class right, and its group of experts, the experts that they have there have lost or should have lost their credibility, particularly those who are on the left, the so-called left, because America does not have any true left, right? It's both right-wing parties, two right-wing. One is, I would say, a moderate right-wing, and one is more an extreme right-wing, right? So that's what we want to say. America does not have a left-wing party, has never had one. Right. The, 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 I guess the closest it went left was under FDR, which was not still a left up, you know, because after he died and then America saw that it was now the preeminent power in the world, they became the country, the warmonger, the country of warmongers, right, under both Democratic and Republican parties. So this is what the New York Times is saying, that Trump is here or he seemed to have challenged the status quo the American status quo of the same 
everything that Americans need to listen to their leaders and understand that the world has changed. We're not going back. But Americans say there are things that we had in the past that we would like to go back to. We would like to go back to an age where we had industries, we had factories in which America was an industrialized nation and we could work where our unions would back us and would support us, where labor was solidified in the economy. We would like to go back to that era and nothing is wrong with that. Anybody would like to go back to an era in which they thought they were progressive. But Pamela, her slogan was, we are not going back. And she said that very defiantly. And if you should ask me, it was a dark statement to say that she's not going back. You have to have, I know we cannot go back to everything we were because that would be stupidity and a sense of mental delusion, right? You know, you're suffering from, you know, a sort of insanity just to think that we can regress. We can go back to the 1990s or we can go back to the decade of the 1970s. But there are aspects of those decades that we can see could have still, and we could have improved up on, but America decided that she was not going to do so. She was going to become a, the preeminent military power in the world, which is costing Americans, uh, or Americans their jobs and their security. Now, the Washington Post is has opened up. It says Trump tr triumphs. I like this. Trump triumphs. Now we see that Harris has, um, she got 224 of the electoral college votes while Trump got 277. So obviously he would, all of the blue wall, he actually smashed all of that, right? And Kamala has lost the election. So he becomes, um, that's so we have here, he trumps, he Trump triumphs. And um, he becomes second president to win neoconservative terms and first felon. You know, one of the things I'm very, very careful about is for the United States to be being now obstructive. The media now is on a quest on its path of being obstructive to Trump's presidency or his upcoming presidency because he's not, he's not yet officially the president until the ceremony is um is complete or completed in on January 20th. But when he comes to office, when he is officially invested into that position, into that office, I think that the papers are ready, the press, the American you know, media, particularly the left-wing media, are ready to obstruct whatever you know uh, stance he might take. And if that is going to be so, where they're constantly antagonistic to the president, that can lead to a civil war. It can also lead to, you know, a dysfunctional government, the weakening of the democratic system. And it can become military because if Trump sees where he is going to, he's threatened or whatever, he might just order the, the military to do a lot of things and to, you know, impose um, what we call now these draconian laws upon the nation. So we have to be careful about that. Now, what I was saying about Bill Clinton and the Democratic Party is confirmed by people like the Chalmers Johnson. And whatever happened to globalization, that was his the title of his um, writing. In accordance with the logic of Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu, Bill Clinton was actually a much more effective imperialist than George W. Bush. During the Clinton administration, the United States employed an, an indirect approach in imposing its will on other nations, right? So it wasn't direct, but it was, and they did it through the economics, and you're going to see that. The government of George W. Bush, by contrast, dropped all legitimizing principles and adopted the view that might makes right. History tells us that an, ex an expansive nation must at least attempt to disguise what it is doing if it wants to consolidate its gains. It must pretend that its exploitation of the weak is in their own best interest. So we'll talk about the IMF and the World Bank and all of these neoliberal institutions, that's what they always do. They always impose upon you austerity and they say to you that it is in your best interest when it is not, is to weaken you so that the stronger can control the weaker. 
or a consequence of the spread of civilization or in accordance with scientific laws. So he's going to tell you all of that, that economics, that's what you have to do that because that is what the laws of economics say. And that's the science, anything but deliberate aggression by a hyper power. Clinton camouflaged his policies by carrying them on out under the banner of globalization. So they say that we have to come together as a world and we have to have free trade agreements, and that's what they do. This proved quite effective in maneuvering rich but gullible nations to do America's bidding. For example, Argentina or in destabilizing potential rivals, for example, South Korea and Indonesia in 1992 economic crisis. And remember now it was just after Bill Clinton left office that Argentina fell became a disaster. What was known to have been the Paris of Latin America became a disaster economically because of these neoliberal policies that were implemented in that country, in that Southern South American country. So this is what we see. So the main agents of imperialism were Clinton, Secretary of, uh, of, of Treasury, Robert Rubin and his deputy today, president of Harvard University, Lawrence Summers. And we know that Lawrence Summers went into the Barack Obama's um, um, office, his administration. The United States ruled the world, but did so in a carefully masked way that produced high degrees of acquiescence among the dominated nations. So the nations are dominated and they're enslaved but they do not know and they will say they have democracies and because the United States is a democracy and is actually trying to strengthen their democracy when it's really weakening theirs and making them into peons and slaves. Now, listen to what this author is saying. Our government seems not to grasp the relationship between its military unilateralism and the collateral damage it is doing to international commerce, an activity that depends on mutually beneficial relationships among individuals, businesses, and countries to function well. If foreign creditors conclude that the United States is no longer a defender of international law, they may lose interest in investing in such a country. Right? So that is what is happening in the U.S. People are doubtful about the U.S. And right now we can see the BRICS and these countries coming together because they're saying that the United States is really um, getting out of control. And they might not be able to trade to invest in the United States. And the citizens are going to lose because if they have no investments, then what's going to happen? All the investments are going to be brought to other countries and Americans will suffer because the country has now been financialized. It's no longer an industrial nation. Um, the United States has lost that status. And I don't think that it will ever get it back. Many of Trump's followers are hoping that he will, but let's be honest with ourselves. The man is 78 years old. He's not going to be a savior. He might get some things done. Hopefully God will give him wisdom and he will do the right thing. And he will choose, you know, competent advisors around him. Now, what does this Trump victory portend for Caribbean people and, you know, people that they call minority? It's the same as usual. I don't think that there is going to be any major shift as our, you know, people, the governments in the Caribbean and people, you know, minorities in America are suggesting. I don't think there is going to be any great shift. There might be a minimization, a reduction in the wars that are waged around the world because Trump is not necessarily a person who likes just one war if he's not getting anything out of it. So that might be good for the world and might be good for America specifically. But I don't think that there is going to be any great political shift. What I do believe, if the press, if the American media, the mainstream media in America, do not allow Trump to run his presidency and to have you know, a seamless transition, I think that it could, that's where the rubber will hit the road. And I think that they will have to be careful and should not try to as much bring out um, the worst, the worst sort of 
personality trait out of Trump if he deems himself to be challenged by the establishment. So I think that we have to be we have to be careful here. Who is really the, the enemy? I don't think Trump is. I think the establishment is more of America's enemies, more of the world's enemies, the warmongers, those in the Pentagon. I think that they are the real enemies, not the president. Because at the end of the day, the president has to do, for the most part, the bidding of these people. Now, he might decide that he might be recalcitrant, but how much can he be? How much will they tolerate his resistance? Did Trump also have an agreement with them before you know, they allowed him to win? Because they could have also disallowed him to win. But again, as I, su I suggested, that God is the one who sets up in the final analysis. So even if they wanted him not to have won, and it is God's desire that he wins. Not that God is involved in human politics, but he is the, the, the ultimate control because he is the sovereign of the universe and whatever is fulfilling his will, not that this person is God's pick, but he allows that person to win so that his agenda, that God's agenda, that his will can be completed in our lives. So I hope that you have learned something and I hope to see you in another video. All the best to you. Bye-bye.